Hello, Namaskar and a very good afternoon to all the viewers watching NCRT's live telecast on eVidya channel number 6 and 11. Besides, we have so many different mediums through which you all can connect with us and you can participate in our live interactive sessions. So let me apprise you that one of the mediums for your information, it is our YouTube channel that is NCERT official and it's Friday 2.30 p.m. and on Fridays we have our special program that is Manudarpan Paricharcha, a series of initiatives on mental well-being and psychosocial support for all the students and viewers watching our sessions. So let me also apprise you that as it is a very special initiative by the Ministry of Education. So in case if you want to explore more about it, then here is our website link that is flashing on your screens. So you can log into the website and explore more about Manudarpan Paricharcha, about this initiative and what it talks about. So it is www.manudarpan.education.gov.in. Besides, we also have our national helpline. Uh, if you would like to call us, then this is the number 844. 844-0632 and you can also watch the live stream of this particular session on our Facebook page that is National Council of Educational Research and Training NCERT. Now here we come up with certain interesting and important topics for all our viewers. So you must be willing to know what is it that we are going to discuss in today's conversation. Well the title is Coping with Feelings of Underachievement and Failing. Now, underachievement, it could happen due to plethora of varied reasons. But at the same time, it is very important to seek assistance at the very right moment. Uh, maybe through someone who knows better how to plan or how to be well organized with everything that they are doing. And also, it is important to enhance our skills and be confident in our personality without comparing ourselves with others. So, providing us more insights into this particular topic and in today's conversation, we are joined by our esteemed guests. So, allow me to introduce you with the guest of today's Manudarpan Paricharcha session. Here we have with us Dr. Tulika De. Namaskar ma'am, good afternoon. We welcome you in the conversation. Ma'am is Associate Professor at DESM from Northeast Regional Institute of Education NCRT, Shillong. Ma'am will be moderating this conversation for all of you. Then we are also joined by Dr. Manisha Khetrapal. Namaskar, ma'am. We welcome you as well. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you. Uh, ma'am is HM at KVIIT from Guwahati, Assam. Then we are joined by our third speaker, Ms. Bartha G. Dakhar. Namaskar, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We welcome you. With open arms, uh, ma'am is Executive Director at Bethany Society from Shillong. And our fourth and the last speaker of today's conversation is Dr. Caroline Y. Karmalki. Namaskar, ma'am. Good afternoon. Very good afternoon. We welcome you as well. Ma'am is Assistant Professor at Directorate of Educational Research and Training from Meghalaya, Shillong. So here I would like to bring to the notice of all our viewers an important information regarding G20. We are proud that India assumed the G20 presidency and will convene the G20 Leader Summit for the first time in the country in this year, that's 2023. The nation is deeply committed to democracy and multilateralism. And uh, India's G20 presidency will be a watershed moment in her history as it seeks to play a very major role by finding pragmatic global solutions for the well-being of everyone and in doing so manifesting the true spirit of Vasudev Kutumbakam or the world is one family. So getting back to our conversation on Manudarpan Paricharcha regarding coping with the feelings of underachievement and failing. So our viewers, uh, you all know the different mediums through which you can connect with us. You can participate by raising your questions, queries, feedback in the comment section of NCRT official or either if you are watching this particular live telecast through television, then we have our contact number as it has been displayed on your screens and our mail IDs as well through which you can connect with us. So uh, here, in order to forge ahead in the conversation, I would request uh, Tulika ma'am to take the discussion forward. Yeah, Namaskar once again. And it is very good 
to see all my fabulous panelists here for the discussion today. As you are all aware that the Manadarpan Paricharcha series, as it has already been told, are focusing on issues related to examination, anxiety, and stress. And so the Paricharcha sessions are aiming at providing psychosocial support and strategies for coping with examination, anxiety, and stress. And this is the time of examinations. So with examinations around, we often see our students are anxious about their results, even before they appear for the exams. Fear of not achieving the grades as per their expectations or their parents, also as a matter of fact, the teacher's expectations. Fear of failing often causes a lot of stress in the minds. We understand that fear of failing can lead to a broad range of emotional and psychological problems, like shame, how to face my friends, how to face my family members. They can be depression, anxiety, panic attacks, or even low self-esteem. And it may negatively affect how one performs at school and at home, or how one interacts with friends and the family members. Sometimes, in order to be perfect in our work that we do, anxiety. So in line with that, in today's session, we are going to discuss about an important kind of examination-related stress and anxiety. That is the feeling that I might fail or I have actually failed and also the attendant feeling of not having achieved as well as I had expected to. These two related feelings are quite common as we see among the students just before the exam or as a matter of fact, even after the exams are over. When the children are awaiting the results and such feeling often persists long after the results are out. As part with their expectations. So there is a need to equip our children with the ways to cope with such feelings, fears, and events that might have occurred or are coming soon. And so this afternoon, we have some of the very, very experts in the field who are here to shed light on the different aspects of this situation and problem. So uh, I think this is the time for me to invite my first panelist for today, Dr. Manisha Khetrapal, headmistress, KVIIT Guwahati Assam. Ma'am, uh, I open the discussion with you and let with the uh, hope that we can hear from you the whole idea of underachievement and what are the factors of this underachievement that you see. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Namaskar to everyone. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank NCRT New Delhi and NIRI for this opportunity to be a part of this a very pertinent discussion. Uh, can I have the presentation, please? The first slide. Yes, Manisha. The first one. Yeah, yeah. The first one, man. Huh. Thank you. I begin with the quote of Honorable Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. We are all born with a divine fire, and all it takes for one is to give wings to it. So we all, all children, everyone in fact is born is unique and has got some special talent and abilities. But uh, unfortunately, we see that some of us, some of the students 
are not able to fly high as expected or as per their potential. So as a teacher for the last 18 years, uh, I feel it's the most painful thing to see uh, students who are not able to perform as per their potential. So this brings us, the next slide please, uh, this brings us to the idea of underachievement and how to uh, cope with the feelings of underachievement. The next, because it's very important to un understand why do students feel they are underachieving? In fact, why teachers and parents feel that some students are underachieving? These issues have to be addressed. Only then we can help to help the students to cope with these issues. Because uh, when we see, as Madam has also told, when we see that students are underachieving or not performing as per their potential, it leads to mismatched expectations. And that often is a uh, reason for a lot of stress. And, it's very, and that leads to then further problems with the child's socio-emotional problems the child faces. So it's very important for us to first look at the factors and what is, I, what is underachievement and then the factors so that as parents, as teachers and counselors, we are able to help the students to overcome these issues. Is it something to do with their environment? Is it something to do with our role as teachers and parents that uh, leads to such feelings of underachievement. So it's a whole gamut of factors that we need to look at very closely. So we need to know why this gap is there. The next. Underachievement implies a gap between potential, what a child ought to be able to do and actual performance. Children have their innate ability, their intelligence, and such children, generally students who are underachieving, they perform very well in standardized tests, in intelligence tests. But when it comes to the school environment, when it comes to the school performance, academic performance in school, then we see that they are lagging behind. Even within that, they may lag behind in certain subjects and in certain subjects, they may be doing well. So uh, it is a mismatch between their ability and their actual performance in school. So it's the difference between the ability of a student, which may be understood in terms of intelligence and his or her academic achievement. Often this may lead to a kind of frustration among them among the students. The next one. The students end up feeling that they could have done much better than they have actually performed. So, and at times they also tend to lose focus because of it. If it happens repeatedly, if it keeps on happening, then it lowers their motivation levels also and the drive to achieve targets. It leads to self-doubt, low self-confidence, anxiety, and low self-esteem. The next one. So as we know, intelligence without ambition is a bird without wings. If students are intelligent, they have the capability, but at times they also lack that drive or they don't feel motivated and explore their talents. So here there is a big role for us teachers and count as parents to see how we can recognize that potential and motivate the child to realize that potential so that uh, they, they, can, they are able to reach their maximum uh, performance. The next one. So we come with this, we come to the underlying factors the underlying factors which lead to underachievement in students are many. So these are both located in the child at times and also in the environment because it is our role as parents and teachers somewhere, uh, uh, maybe our behavior, we are not nurturing enough or we are not able to 
uh, recognize their potential or sometimes it also happens uh, inadvertently our uh, you know the way our interaction the classroom environment all of these may contribute so let us look at these factors one by one uh, fear of failure or lack of motivation sometimes it happens some every child has a different persona so at times children they feel they want to do everything uh, you know perfectly the desire to achieve perfection in everything so at times even that fear inhibits their performance that they want to do everything to the perfection uh, and they want to give their 100% but at times that itself the fear that maybe i will not be able to be successful that inhibits their efforts to even uh, they uh, you know their effort to put in their efforts also it inhibits so that also leads to a lack of motivation the next is very important one uh, you know the previous slide i am coming to the next point the lack of stimulating learning environment in school we often see children uh, who may underperform or underachieve due to a very uninteresting or lack of stimulating environment in the uh, classroom environment maybe it's not challenging enough the task is not challenging enough so that itself even uh, the the methodology the teaching learning interaction so all that contribute uh, to a child's uh, you know it it may not uh, you know in in uh, motivate the child to give their maximum uh, effort so ultimately what happens the child will not perform uh, well in the uh, academic the achievement test in the school environment so here we can see that the teacher's role is very important how we make the things very interesting very challenging so that children of varied intelligence levels varied uh, aptitudes are able to you know engage themselves meaningfully in the classroom the next is class lack of encouragement in class here also a teacher's role is very important uh, we have seen students in the past so many years i've seen students sometimes they have ability they have the talent but because it is not recognized by the teacher it is not appreciated by the teacher enough they take a back seat they don't want to come forward and give their best in the classroom a child may be very good at general knowledge general awareness but when a teacher might it, it's not intentional but sometimes it happens that uh, the teacher may not look at that child or sometimes you know that that ability gets ignored and if it keeps on happening then the child may feel that okay it's okay better i be you know i may not i i need not participate because i am never in the forefront or i never do well anyway so what's the point in uh, you know going ahead so uh, they start taking a back seat and a kind of disinterest uh, develops in the students this also may lead to uh, a child feeling or seeing himself or herself as inadequate they may feel i may be falling short in certain kind of uh, you know what is expected of me sometimes parents and teachers we expect uh, you know we set unrealistic targets or we expect too much that may also kind of you know uh, inhibit the child they feel threatened okay i am not up to that mark so whatever input the child might have been trying to put even that gets restricted so uh, here also gradually the child may feel that i in a, a, you know i am not able to meet up to the expectation so here we may need to look at ourselves as to what are we you know are we trying to impose uh, certain unrealistic targets for the child so uh, that is one factor the next factor is emotional problems or disturbed family atmosphere because we have students who may be having uh, you know who may not be getting adequate support at home or may be going through some kind of emotional upheavals at home so that definitely will affect the academic achievement 
So it's very important to have a holistic understanding of a child, have a one-on-one -on -one bonding, understanding of the child's circumstances. It's very important, I feel, to even assess when we see a child not performing well. So we need to look at, you know, we need to talk to the child. We need to assess the, talk to the child, and then we may come to know as to what is it. Maybe is it lack of understanding of concepts? Is it lack of, you know, uh, conceptual clarity? Or it is lack of some other problems that the child may be facing at home. So that's, again, a very... Uh, pertinent, you know, important factor which leads because children uh, get affected by what is going on at home. So, and also there may be students who don't have parents who are able to assist them academically. So that is also one uh, factor. So all of this inhibits the performance of the child, the achievement of the child in the school. Uh, one important, which is a recent uh, phenomenon, I would say, is the social media distraction. Somewhere, uh, I feel, as I have been seeing in my interaction in school itself, you know, and otherwise also, uh, since the past two years, as the uh, it has happened that children are somehow not able to, you know, uh, allocate the time uh, or divide the time in an organized way. So uh, it's kind of, uh, they get uh, distracted by social media, too much time spent on the phone. And when they are even in crucial stages, like they are appearing for 10th and 12th, then also because uh, they have been so much used to this uh, use of so, uh, uh, phone that they find it, you know, uh, difficult to stay away. So this repeated distraction leads to lack of concentration. And this definitely will uh, affect their achievement. So it's not only the ability, the, the child has the ability, the child uh, has the potential, but due to this kind of a, this, you know, uh, disproportionate time that is being, you know, spent on uh, social media or this kind of a uh, distraction, the child is not able to utilize the time. The, so this is related to even the time management. How, how much time the child uh, allocates to the different, you know, to the preparation before exams, to the preparation. So we also need to even talk to children, have a discussion about their daily schedule. What are they, you know, what are the activities they are spending time on? So this will give us an insight as to what is one of the reasons, it may be one of the reasons which leads to their underachievement. So these uh, uh, factors that we have discussed regarding their underachievement are not in isolation, I feel. At times, it's a combination of factors, a combination of uh, you know, uh, reasons which may lead to their underachievement. But it is for us teachers, and uh, it's very important to understand this, to analyze this, to reflect and discuss with the students regarding this, because once we have a deeper understanding of this, only then we can move on to help or support the child to cope with these factors, to address these issues. So the next one, please. And with that, I would also like to uh, summarize my uh, presentation. It's uh, you know by being observant and by identifying these factors, we can help you know, to support our students in a meaningful manner, because uh, this underachievement should not become a kind of a habit or an imbibed, the child should not imbibe this as a kind of, okay, uh, I am like this and it will stay on. So we have to, when we notice these things, when we observe these things, we have to be very alert and we have to be very proactive talk to the students and try to see where uh, the students, what are the reason, possible reasons for this and help the students to address. Because ultimately, if unaddressed, if we don't help the child to cope with these, then what happens is uh, they might think it may become a way of life with them. Then ultimately it may lead to other you know, uh, problems in future. So every child is unique with special abilities and potential. 
and it is our responsibility to nurture this uh, ability and to give us give them that support so that uh, each one is able to achieve the maximum achieve the maximum and live a very uh, you know and uh, mainly ensure the so that they can be happy and satisfied ultimate is that so uh, that's all i would like to say we are responsible for the making and breaking of our children that's a huge responsibility and uh, that's what and as parents and you know teachers counselors as a team we need to go ahead in this thank you thank you ma'am for your insights into this problem of uh, fear of failing and the ex examination anxiety uh, you have really beautifully put forward the points what are the factors behind the how the home environment is important how the environment of the school is important the role of the parents and teachers in this to deal with these kinds of problems that the students are facing and also the i like the way you have put forward that how often that there is a mismatch between the ability of the child and the performance that he or she has done in the exams yes these are so very true and also one more factor that you have underlined is that the lack of encouragement from the teachers and maybe the same is true for the parents too that children find it so very difficult to cope and were very nice uh, points have come out and i i think with this we can open up more the discussion with the madam uh, our second panelist madam bartha didakar um, madam i would now request you to throw some light on some of the strategies for coping with feelings of underachievement and failing thank you uh, tulika good afternoon good afternoon madam yes feelings of underachievement and dealing with failure everybody listening right now who has not experienced any of this in their lives um, i'm sure each one of us it doesn't have to be only school children yes ma'am even even at our age you know even now i'm very sure after the end of my 20 minutes i'll be saying to myself why did i do that i missed that i should have done that right it, it's it's always there because uh because this feeling will always come after any kind of a performance or after an examination however uh what i would like to ask ourselves first who are you know trying create a better learning environment for our children have we reflected within ourselves how we've dealt with this manisha very uh, comprehensively open up you know the areas why it happens but as adults we can reflect and and we can think why this feeling comes is it there is it really there should it be there should i have i been happy with this did i deserve to fail did i not deserve to have done less after all if i've not prepared better now uh then we try to identify why but as adults we can do that and that's how maybe we can deal better but we are talking of children we are talking of uh, adolescents we are talking of young people young adults who are yet to enter their lives with all their expectations now uh, we we could go on talking about this the the feelings you know that we have the frustration the exasperation the despair the 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 blame you blame yourself you blame others the as manisha had said the shame and 
and, and there's so many other feelings. But what is important is what has happened has happened. How do we deal with it? Uh, this uh, topic, actually, it's about coping, coping with these feelings. Now, what is coping? Coping is dealing with problems and challenges, but with a degree, especially with a degree of success. That means when we apply any strategy, it, it should yield some success. It should be positive. Now, as I've said that as adults, we experience these feelings, whether at in the various roles that we play. And do we do? do what do we do? We react or we respond to that situation. Now, these are two very important, um, two very important ways of dealing with such situations. Do we react or do we respond? And there is a difference. And at my point in age, I shouldn't be reacting. I should be responding because that is more positive. Reactions we may bring in other consequences that is harmful to the person and harmful to the others. Um, we need not go into the various uh, emotional uh, situations where people can get to, because it depends from one person to another how long that feeling stays and how much the intensity of that feeling. All this depends on the support that we get and the support that we can give. Okay, now let us go back to our school children. Let us go back to our learners. I love to call them learners. The, the younger ones, the older ones. Let us, um, let us look at them. How, as has been said earlier, from which background they come, what kind of environment they experience in the school, the, the kinds of relationships that they have, this will determine how much they can cope with the either that feeling of having done lesser than I should or even failing. Now, there are two ways in doing this. One is the direct support that can be given after we have detected that a child, a learner is going through a stage. It may be uh, very shallow or maybe at a very intense uh, state of feelings and emotions that uh, we, we look and we give that intervention that is needed. Manisha had said that that is the role of teachers, that is the role of parents, and that is the role of counselors. Yes, I'm happy that in our country, various attempts are being made to ensure that we have counselors in our schools. But <laughs> with the number of children we have in each school, I don't know how many counselors we would require. There should be a proportion. And also, um, it would be uh, even better if our counselors would specialize in the area of uh, you know, dealing with children in the context of education. And if we had uh, school social workers, they also would be good. I, I don't know how much of uh, our social work schools in the country 
do school so social work as a, a specialization. That would be helpful because it gives the direct support that children may need. But I'm sorry to say this, but I would have to say it for the good of the child. As counselors, whether we are parents, we are teachers or professionals, it's very important that we maintain that sense of the ethics of confidentiality. Because once a child knows that his story has been discussed or told to somebody else, finish, he won't go to that counselor again. And let us hope that we breed, you know, uh, counselors who, who can who can do justice to the role that has been given to them. Okay, then then of course, if the cases go very bad, uh, very deep, then we we have the services of psychologists. We have even clinical psychologists. We have psychiatrists, and 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 it goes on, depending on the need. That, that is the direct support. But one thing we have to remember, emotional wounds are not physical wounds. You get a cut, fine, put a band-aid. That should stop. But when it comes to emotional wounds, it's more than that. Of course, uh, there may be ways, but it takes longer and it, 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 it will involve not only the child and the school, but as Manisha had said, the, the family and, and anybody who are connected with the child. So the process of healing is, is, um, is very delayed. And uh, so for me today, I would look more on that maxim. Prevention is better than cure. Um, now, what, what steps do we take to prevent? And these are long discussed strategies that we keep saying at various platforms, but how much of it is being practiced? What we're going to talk about is again reflected either directly or indirectly in the new education policy. You know, I really have great hopes that it would change, it would improve on our education system so that our learners, right from that three-year-old uh, entering the, the early childhood uh, education level to the elder, the oldest who would be leaving into the world of work may get the best benefit of the schooling that uh, he had uh, received. The, like to, like, okay, before we go into it, let us go back first to the family to the home environment. We keep saying that, yes, children spend a lot of time in the schools, but they are, they are still not our children. They belong to their parents. They belong to their families. And these parents and families have the responsibility of bringing up their children. And it's very important, the attitude that parents have, whether they view their child as an individual, as a unique, uh, as a unique human being with his own abilities, with his own strengths, his own weaknesses, his own wishes, his own drives, his own ambitions, or do they look at children as their prototypes, you know, or somebody who would fulfill a wish not being able to fulfill by them in their, in their youth or in their lives? 
Let us give space to our children. Let us understand them as parents. Let us be aware of what they can do, of what they cannot do. Because if we have too many expectations, especially if expectations not shared by the child heart of hearts, whether it's the stream you want to follow, whether it's the way you want to learn, uh, whether it's uh, how you want to perform, uh, let's, let's just um, allow the child to grow in that environment. Because if we have too many expectations, if we start uh, controlling the child too much, he ceases to be an individual. And that's when all the harm starts to happen in his mind and in his emotions. So uh, that is with the family. The second one is a safe environment, whether for the child to live in, in the family or in the school. It was uh, said so in the earlier, uh, by our earlier speaker. But I would like to say that uh, children have these, you know, the four main emotions of a child in the school is glad, mad, sad, scared. If we look at those four, one is very positive. The three, mad, angry, sad, and scared. They're frightened, they're fearful. These are the dominant emotions of a child. So if the number one, the glad is promoted and the three are, are uh, alleviated, it would be a perfect emotional environment for the child to live in. And, and so in the home, because in the home also, children have to study. But if you have parents barking at them all the time, I don't know how much they can learn. So let us not build up these stress and bring in more stress factors into our children. The, the, the second one is um, the school also. The teachers, I may say, what is the purpose of us going into the classroom or teaching? Is it to complete the syllabus? Is it to make the child pass? Is it to make our children score the highest marks or earn the greatest percentage? Or, I mean, because sometimes that is what we see and earn the school a good name. Let us not use children for our own gratification. Let us not exploit them. We ought to change the aim of education. Of course, in BED, in, in all these, we learn the aim of education is so and so, holistic development and all that. Is it happening? What is happening is language, uh, sorry, knowledge acquisition. And unless we as a country, as the system, we acknowledge that the aim of education is to make the child emerge from the school as an expert learner. If we, can't, if we don't change that aim, then it will remain the same. And we'll be talking again and again of how to cope with feelings of underachievement and, feel, and, and you know, the, 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 uh, the feelings of shame and all because of failing. Next, the evaluation system. As I said, too much importance is being given to examinations half yearly examinations, term and examinations, board examinations, 
entrance examinations. Okay, that's the biggest stress around. But, and why, 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 but if it's a good thing, why do we have to talk about coping with failing? Maybe there is something wrong about the system. It's because of that pure summative nature where it's very bulky reading and all that knowledge to be spilled out and vomited, right? We ought to look at another way of assessment and evaluation of our children. Because when we talk only of, examine, of, of the summative examinations, it's usually touching the cognitive domain, domain only. Let us again look, the NEP says transforming the culture of examinations. Let us not look at what teachers say at all, but let look at the child. If we could start the formative, uh, formative assessment in the classroom, that is where that is where the learning gaps are identified. That's where the scaffolding begins. And this is where we touch all the domains. We touch the cognitive, we touch the affective, that means the, the feelings, the emotions, and we touch the kinesthetic. And, and, then, we, and the, then only we will know that the child is trying to cope and that, okay, uh, I don't know how much time I have. Huh? Uh, it's nearly a thing. But Ma'am, you may continue. What, yeah. What I would like to speak at this time is what in our organization is our, our big mantra. And that is social emotional learning in the schools. And in some ways also it's been reflected in the national education policy. Now, social emotional learning is a process. It is a process of developing self-awareness, self-control and interpersonal skills that are vital for a child to interact in the school or for adults to interact in our workplaces and other situations. Social emotional learning maybe has been tried in some ways through, you know, subjects like value education or something or the other, or, you know, we have in our uh, um, social science, maybe in some of our subjects, in a very thing where you are aware of yourself, you are aware, but you're aware of the physical self. I, I don't remember uh, us having gone through any more than this, but social emotional learning is where the child, just as parents are aware of what the child can do, so the child is groomed in such a way that he is aware of himself, of what he can, of what he cannot do, in what ways he can improve himself. The other area is in, in you know, in self-control and the learning of other skills, interpersonal skills, intrapersonal, interpersonal. Because those who have strong social and emotional skills. They, they, they can cope better with everyday challenges. And everyday challenges would mean challenges in the classroom, challenges of examinations. They have been so taught and groomed. You know that as they grow older, they, as the maturity sets in, so the learning of skills also matures and sets in as per the requirements 
of the emotional requirements of the age that they go through. You know, the social emotional learning is, is starting right from effective problem solving, ending up in self-discipline. Then it starts from impulses control to emotional management. I'm very sure that if we could start this in our schools, right from the beginning, uh, as in the new thing now, it's the foundational stage. It goes on to the preparatory, to the whatever. Uh, you know, it goes on and on and on. It never stops. Social emotional learning should not be confined only to the lower standards and say we don't have time for it. We have to learn physics, maths, chemistry in the higher. We don't have time in the routine. That was the mistake. Why our students are suffering as they do now? Social emotional learning, uh, if we really look at it, it starts from the beginning. It's being graded. It has its own curriculum and it ends right at the top, higher secondary level. So uh, this, this is the only way how we can ensure that our children are emotionally sound as learners. As I said, these are preventive measures. And when we take up preventive measures, we also promote mental uh, well-being in our children. And that is what all this program is about. Recently, the World Health Organization has released its report. And it's very interestingly put it as transforming mental health for all. Because if we want to promote mental health and well-being in our students as teachers, as administrators, as policy makers, we all have to be mentally well also. Yeah. And, uh, and there is that saying again by WHO, there is no health without mental health. So um, this is just you know, the very core of uh, what social emotional learning is. Perhaps in other sessions, we could go further into this because I really feel that it should be part of the teacher education curriculum. And now is the time when all our um, um, school curriculum, our teacher education curriculums, the frameworks are being revised. So um, let me end with this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam, uh, for your very interesting uh, points that you have raised. It is always a very big pleasure to hear you speak. And uh, today, again, we have experienced so. And so you have thrown light on so many aspects. I was just scribbling through some of the points and then uh, you have talked about as counselors how important it is to maintain the confidentiality. Yes, I think you have once again reminded that uh, when they have, they come, the students come, so they come with their problems and how as teachers or how as counselors, we need to maintain the confidentiality and also uh, the better learning environment for our children in the school or be it at home. The home environment too is very important. Uh, as parents, we need to understand our children and the attitude of the parents also is very, very important to the child. Let's not exploit our children for our own gratification. I was wondering that, uh, yes, how many of us made that um, mistake every day and there, there lies our defeat. And so uh, it once again reminded everyone that not to exploit our children for our own gratification. 
the aim of education also is to make the child emerge as an expert learner. That is what something which probably the NEP 2020 is highlighting. And you have once again highlighted it very beautifully. And to look into the assessment process also once again. And with all this being said, I now open up this discussion to my third panelist, Dr. Carolyn Karmalki uh, from DRT Meghalaya Shalom. Ma'am, to throw you to throw some light on what should be the role for the underachievers. So a very good afternoon once again. Uh, I feel privileged to be part of this uh, panel discussion today under the Manu Darpan platform. Uh, my gratitude goes to Neri uh, Shillong, uh, and in particular, Dr. Prachi for uh, giving me this opportunity to be part of this uh, panel discussion. To the CIET and CRT, to our moderator today, Dr. Tulika, and also to my co-panelists, uh, Madam Bartha and also uh, Dr. Manisha. So once again, a very good afternoon. So before I start with the discussion today, so I have a PowerPoint presentation, but let me just re reiterate, uh, Ma'am Bartha, Bartha just now had mentioned about uh, so many things and so also uh, Dr. Manisha, but then in particular, I do strongly agree towards the mental health that we are talking about because simply we, we, we have a miss on the mental health when we are talking about, we are talking about the entire ecosystem. So that ecosystem, it starts right from the students to the teachers, the principal, and also to the parents of the students. So it is of utmost importance that uh, we also take into consideration, perhaps in the next uh, Manu Darpan platform, we have this topic uh, to be there for discussion. Uh, my presentation today, can we go to the very first slide, please? So it is on underachievement and my role as a teacher. So being a teacher educator and also as a teacher, I can say that uh, it is of, uh, of importance that we have to take into consideration the contribution of the teachers also towards performance of a child. So uh, firstly, I'll not dwell too much because Dr. Manisha also has spoken about underachievement. But just to uh, inform my presentation today, basically it's uh, the citations from various uh, review of related literature that I have taken from studies which have been conducted uh, not only in India, but also from abroad. So these are the various uh, action or maybe the information, the points that uh, has been uh, taken from these studies first. When we're talking about underachievement, it is seen as a discrepancy between a student's academic potential and how he or she is actually performing in school. Two things we're talking about. And it's not uh, tagging or maybe uh, name men mentioning here about uh, who are the good performance uh, performers and who are not. But basically, since this platform, uh, the topic for today is for underachievement. So my focus on that. So two things we are seeing. One, it is, uh, sorry, can we go, I'm still in the first slide. Can we be on the first slide, please? Huh. Uh, first slide, yes. Underachievement, uh, we are talking about, it is students' academic potential and not performing. So it is also occurs when a child's academic performance is below. So uh, not as it is expected. And basically we can see that poorer than expected performance. So that is the underachievement uh, that has been taken from the various studies. So. Slide, please. Yes, Caroline, ma'am, let me continue. Slide. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, underachieving students, they who are they? Uh, I, I will focus on the basic questions of what is underachievement? Who are these underachievers? How, as a teacher, do I tackle the underachievers? 
So uh, who are these underachievers we are saying? So they see themselves as inadequate. They expect academic as well as social failure. They feel helpless to control the outcomes of all the effort that has been put in. They don't feel free to make choices. They do set unrealistic goals. They are defensive towards the authority. They feel rejected and also isolated. They are not willing to risk failure and show ineffective approaches towards any problem that they face. So the underachieving students, we can see that how do they uh, see themselves as. So it is very important as teachers to really distinguish between the achieving students from those who are not being able to achieve. What are the characteristics as teachers that we should look into? Next slide. The first one, lack of integration of goals and self-direction. Next slide, please. A lack of self-confidence, inability to persevere, being inferior, there is an inferior, a complex in the feelings, the social immaturity, the emotional problems that has been spoken of by both our panelists before. Also, it is important to note that we will see antisocial behavior and low self-esteem or lo low self-concept and an unstable family environment. So these are the characteristics that we can see in underachievement. I cannot see the slides changing. Can you please change the slides? So we have the slide uh, displaying characteristics on the screen. I hope it is visible. Now it's visible. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. That is the strategies for underachieving students. So there comes my role as a teacher. What are the important strategies that needs to be undertaken by me as a, by me as a teacher? Can we go to the next slide? The strategies for underachieving students. So first, we will talk about the supportive strategies. Uh, the first strategy is to involve the students in making rules. It is very important to take into consideration the, uh, the, uh, the students into any platform that we are, maybe it can be any common platform, but it, it can be in the classroom, it can be outside the classroom. So involvement of students in every platform is important and also to take decisions, taking into consideration the decisions or maybe the feedback that is coming up from students. So when I, I'll be talking about here, the strategies, not necessarily that it is meant only for children who are underachieving, but this uh, strategy can also be effective for the, for the classroom situation or for the inclusive environment. So need, you need, as a teacher, we also need to set punishment as well as rewards together. So in, I should quote, uh, I'm talking about the strategy here. It's not a one direction or may, uh, maybe a one way traffic where the teacher is the center. But I'm talking about here as the child being the center whereby the child is taken into confidence in every not every i should say but at least the involvement in uh, uh, important decisions or perhaps in terms of uh, making rules which is beneficial towards the child to discuss also the students concern as our sp uh, speakers uh, has already said about the background that the child is coming so it is because of the so many factors that contributes towards the child not being able to perform well as expected. So the factors I'll not be discussing here, but this becomes a student concern. So as a teacher, it is important to discuss these concerns and also to create activities on students' need, not on teachers' need. So like what Ma'am Bertha was talking about gratification also at the end of the day. So we have to uh, 
um, bear this in mind. Everything that we are uh, planning in the classroom, it has to be student need and interest rather than teachers need and interest. And to allow them to superiority, skipping the parts of an assignment because assignment also it's part and parcel of the classroom situation, uh, procedure and rule. But when they have previously shown competency, so at least uh, or acknowledge the, the the child, the the learner, show them the uh, community uh, communicating with the teacher can work in both ways. Not necessarily that the child should always come to the teacher, but it is equally important that the teacher should also go to the child. So this communication works best when it is both ways, not a one direction. And reward system, so important that we miss in today's classroom. We are too focused, like it has already been said, I just re reiterate, focusing on syllabi, completion of the course, and also getting good results. And the, at the end of the day, it's the focal point. We, we miss I mean, the, the, the environment that needs to be created within a classroom. Rewarding is one of the method that can be offered as one of the strategic way to support the children. So be aware of the disadvantage uh, advantages though, but then let's just see at the next slide, the advantages of a reward system. What advantage can it produce towards giving a reward to, uh, to, the, uh, to anything that the child has done? Can we go to the next slide, please? The first one. A gesture only, appropriate behavior, just a gesture. It's so important for a child to be acknowledged or maybe to be appreciated. A reward can also increase the motivation for a child to do much, much better perhaps for the next assignment, for the next project, for the next test, so uh, for the next assessment, so on and so forth. And it also create a joyful environment. The students, just a smiley in their exercise book can also encourage the, the uh, perhaps the coach, uh, the children, more children also to work better so that they get those smileys within the classroom situation. It can boost their self-esteem. And also, so if a reward is being given at the end of completion of their assignment or homework, that is also motivated. And you can see the advantage of a reward system. It can improve the results or the performance of the children within a grade or a classroom. But towards every advantage, there is always a disadvantage also. So what can be the dis disadvantages? This will be in the next slide. If there are too much of the award, the student tends to be addicted. So the next slide, please. The disadvantages of a reward system. Addiction towards getting rewards always. Not focusing on the quality, but on the quantity of submitting homework, or maybe assignments and getting rewards. One disadvantage can be there will be a devaluation because of the reward system. Maybe instead of being motivated, so the children will the the the, the performance can be uh, going down. It will be devaluated, and also there will be in a rush. The child will be in a rush to race against the clock. Reason is because. I will not, perhaps I will not check the spellings. I will not check maybe I've underlined, not underlined, whether I've done it correctly, not correctly, because the teacher has, a teacher has set a deadline. So I'll race against the clock because of the reward. And it becomes a control and manipulative towards the system also. It increases the anxiety, the pressure because of the reward. So ch children will be excited, anxious, to complete their work. And it is kind of a bribe. If you do well, you'll get reward. If you don't do well, 
maybe you get a punishment. So it depends on the wisdom of the teacher to use judiciously the reward system. Not that I will say that it is uh, that you stop using the reward system in the uh, school, but at least you know when and where to use it. The next slide, please. Some uh, the supportive uh, strategies I've talked about. So now the intrinsic strategy, what should I do as a teacher? So uh, for a child to achieve academically without the teacher or maybe the parent telling them what they should do. Very important that the child takes ownership of his work, whether it is a success or a failure. It is so important that the child should understand the ownership. Once the students wants to follow their dreams or their own goals, the students or perhaps the child should work more and more harder. It is so important that as a teacher, we need to guide this, the, our own children, maybe the learners in the classroom, to set their own goals. Because once goals and targets are being set, then to create a path to reach that goal becomes much easier. For a teacher, it is equally important to create a classroom that provides or maybe that invites positive attitude. Rather than a stressful environment within the classroom, a child-friendly environment with positive attitude makes more learning, makes the environment more safe, secure, rather than being too strict, rigid. So because this automatically is likely to improve the achievement as well as the performance of the child. As a teacher, we also need to encourage attempts. If at once the saying goes, if at once we don't succeed, try again. So the same applies. If I fail in one attempt, in two attempts, try again. Not because I need to get success, but this will improve. And this will also help to correct maybe the mistakes that is being committed at the first time or maybe at the second time. A, a child will want to learn the best if he himself dreams or imagined of it. Also, as a teacher, we need to allow the students to evaluate their own work. Self-assessment is so important. The policy, the national education policy talks about teachers' self-assessment, but it is also of equal importance that the child also self-assess so that they'll be able to understand before they, before the, what they have done prior to the exam, at the end of the exam, or perhaps at the end of a remedial teaching. So that will be our next strategy. We can go to the next slide. Which is, which is the remedial strategies. Not everybody is perfect. As uh, Dr. Manisha has also mentioned that every child is unique. In fact, every person is unique in oneself. Nobody is perfect. So every student also have their own strengths and also weaknesses. As an adult also, I have my own strengths and my own weaknesses. So these strengths can motivate me to, or maybe can motivate a child to grow into a better citizen. And the weaknesses can be corrected so that they can also be taken as strengths to become their, uh, to, to develop their positive attitude towards uh, uh, their needs. Uh, Okay, so use different types of teaching methods to give the students a chance to excel. Instead of a monotonous, traditional way of teaching in the classroom, it is of utmost importance that 2020 also have focus on new pedagogies and multi uh, multidisciplinary uh, approach to be undertaken in the real classroom situation. It is of importance also that teachers should find out ways and means to improve their methodology as well as their pedagogical approaches 
in the classroom situations in order to give a chance for the child to access to excel in their strengths and also in their interests so provide the opportunities in specific areas with learning difficulties early identification by a teacher is important for learning difficulties then only you can think about remediation exercise how do you strategize your remedial teaching it will be only if you identify their learning difficulties the remediation can be only done if the environment is safe and mistakes are considered as part of learning nobody is perfect so mistakes are being committed so that we can build on the mistakes to acquire success teach the students the 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 child the value of getting up after a knockout not that we stumble we fall that is our failure it is of importance that as a teacher i do always remind my children my learners that if you feel once you need to step up and perhaps that will give a much greater strength to put my focus on those failures mistakes and do better next time failure leads to success as we all know that the failure are the pillars towards success focus on the strength the next slide please what is those strength it is important for the teacher to focus on the strength rather than on the weakness of the students so pinpointing maybe it's so very difficult i mean it's not a good technique for a teacher to have this in the classroom situation this goes both ways when we are talking about strengths it has to be both the teacher as well as the child the student has to acknowledge their own strengths very important not the teacher will will identify the strengths of the child but the child oneself has to acknowledge his or her own strengths create challenging activities in a variety of ways and opportunities for for the children to utilize their strengths and interests so that they can improve their performance and facilitate in depth learning because if we focus too much on their weaknesses it demotivates the child to learn and maybe that can be one of the reason for the dropping out of children from school so as teachers we have to play a very vital role in dealing with the children and we should be also aware that children nowadays are very emotional so in comparison if i if i look at myself when i was in my school days i was not at all that emotional because during that point of time my parents in fact they will tell the teacher or the principal to punish or maybe to 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 uh to give all sorts of punishments so that i improve in my learning but nowadays it is just the vice versa the parents will go to the school to complain if at all their children are being punished so we play a very uh, critical role in the school successful experiences lead to success so encourage the students to go from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset what is a fixed mindset and a growth mindset this is in the next slide please when so as individuals maybe as adults adults also we need to understand whether we are a fixed mindset or a growth mindset then only we can motivate our children to be a fixed or to be growing mindset fixed success comes from talent when we are a fixed mindset i need a smart or dumb i don't like challenges failure means i cannot do it feedback it's only a personal attack if you succeed if i succeed or uh, sorry if my friends if my if my uh, co uh, colleagues or me, my co teachers succeed i feel threatened too hard for me to do i just simply 
give up. So that is the attitude of a fixed mindset. So we need to imbibe the growth mindset in the child, starting from myself. Success, it only comes from effort. I can grow my intelligence. Intelligence, it's not a want of destination. My success has no limits. Sorry, my intelligence or maybe my learning has no limits. I embrace the challenges as a chance to grow. Rather than taking the challenge as a defeat, I take the challenges as a chance to grow. Failure means learning. Feedback will definitely help me to grow into a better person, maybe. And if I or if my colleagues, friends, they succeed, I feel so inspired. And I keep trying even when I'm frustrated. So we can see the difference between the two types of mindsets here, the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. I can imbibe a growth mindset into my children if only myself, I have a growth mindset. So what can me as a teachers do then in the next slide, please? As Davis Rim 1994 pointed out that children are not born under achievers. Next slide, please. Achieve, under achievement, it's only a learned behavior and therefore it can be unlearned. Go about that as teachers. Following are some of the positive recommendations in order to help the teachers enable their students to the right to reverse whatever has been said. Underachievement is a learned behavior, so I need to unlearn that. So how do you do that? So you ensure that opportunities are being provided for both the academic challenge within the classroom as well as outside the classroom. Very important challenges. High ability students need to be given challenge, uh, assignments that challenge them intellectually and enable them to use the higher order processes and skills so that we, we, we don't undermine anybody in here. Everybody can complete achievement, uh, the, the assignments uh, well ahead in time. Provide opportunities also for students to pursue the topics of interest rather than I just throw a, to a topic to the students to just complete the assignment. I also take into consideration that I give an opportunity for the learners to pursue any topic. It can be a project can be given, but the topic has to be the interest of the child rather than me as a teacher through independent projects. This can be done. So instead of providing them with busy work for those students who complete the assignments well ahead of time, in fact, let those very students investigate on their own uh, topics or maybe projects, which is not within the context of the curriculum, but perhaps outside the textbook, outside the curriculum. Empenek in 1995 studied young adults and found that the class that provides opportunities for independent study in areas of interest was believed to promote academic excellence. Nicely said, if at all we provide that opportunity, then we will see that it definitely will promote academic excellence and also help the underachieving students to set their goals. When we are talking about goals here, we have to keep into consideration the realistic goals, achievable, smart goals, we can say. Next slide, please. Of course, Caroline, ma'am, uh, you are discussing about some of the important areas 
that would be very beneficial for all our learners. But ma'am, due to paucity of time, as we are left by the last three to four minutes in the conversation, I'll request you to conclude your words. Okay. Can we go to the, can you, uh, okay, just to wrap it up. Yes. So the lack of, ha. Huh. A uh, lack of basic skills and study habits is, is an important cause of underachievement. So our students nowadays are not being guided. So as teachers, we need to guide our children the basic skills of study habits. Next, in order for the students to learn in an effective way, we need to teach them in an effective learning strategies. And that is uh, uh, an abbreviation. It's called answer. Ask, you explain, you connect to whatever discussion you have put up. N, no cramming. Whatever, it has to be precise and brief. Third, switch. Ideas need to be switched, not a monotonous, um, just like what uh, I have just uh, mentioned monotony in the method of teaching. W, W is for words and visuals. Students, they learn more with what they see rather than, that, than what they, just, they, they are just hearing. E, examples, especially life examples are so important. Lastly, R, recall what you know. So the effective learning strategy lies within the abbreviation answer. So thank you once again. So uh, sure, I, uh, uh, this, th uh, thank you so thank much. You thank you so much, Madam Carolyn. Uh, you have touched upon the supportive strategies, intrinsic strategies and remedial strategies, along with the focus on strength. Uh, uh, the, the, you have also talked about to encourage the attempts made by the child and not just success and also to allow the child to do self-assessment and reflect on the student's expectation of their work. So they teach your students or our students the value of getting up after a knockout and better the next time. So those were a very, very valuable takeaway message from this. But uh, to conclude with today's session, after the today's session, we understand that many a time our students, as well as we as adults, also we experience the fear of failing. Crops up right at that moment of time when we are very ambitious. Yes, ma'am. But one, yes, but no one wants to be in that situation intentionally. And all my panelists have talked about and have laid stress on the environment that we are into, that all we are providing to the children, be it at home or be it at school. And I, I, I once again would like to take a clue from what Ma'am uh, Bartha Dakara said, that the dominant emotions of the child, glad, mad, sad, and scared. And we need to promote the glad emotion of the child, be it at home or be it at school that will give a perfect emotional environment to the child and success will be on the other side of the fear. Uh, Ma'am, thank you so much for these thank uh, beautiful takeaways. Thank you so much takeaways. to all the panelists and we hope to see you once again in future. Of thank course, you. Of course. I would also like to extend a word of thanks to all the four speakers who have been a part of this communication. Uh, Bartha, Ma'am, thank you for discussing on the strategies for coping with the feelings of underachievement and failing. And of course, uh, Manisha, ma'am, thanks a lot for connecting with us and discussing on the idea of underachievement. And uh, Caroline, ma'am, discussing on the role of teachers for underachievers. We are so thankful to all the three speakers. And of course, uh, Tulika, ma'am, thanks to you for moderating it so well among our speakers. So uh, thank you to all the experts uh, and our viewers who have connected for this particular live interactive session. It's time for me to wrap up this particular conversation of Manudarpan Paricharcha. And once again, I would like to bring to your notice an important piece of information regarding G20. We are proud that India assumed the G20 presidency and will convene the G20 Leaders Summit for the first time in the country in this year, that is 2023. The nation is deeply committed to democracy and multilateralism. 
India's G20 presidency would be a watershed moment in her history as it seeks to play a very major role by finding pragmatic global solutions for the well-being of everyone and in doing so manifest the true spirit of Vasudev Kutumbakam or the world is one family. Once again, a word of thanks to all of you. So for more such information, stay tuned with Evidya channels. Keep watching NCRT official. Next up, we have our live session on the series running on Cyber Jagrukta Divas. So we'll be right back within a few minutes. Uh, take very good care of yourself and keep watching NCRT official. Namaskar.